We'll be picking up in chapter 30, verse 22 of Exodus tonight. It would be nice, it would be nice to see Wesley and Angie. It's been a good while. Hopefully that everything will work out well and be with us. If you found your place in Exodus chapter 30, I'll begin reading. Moreover, the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Take thou also unto thee principal spices of pure myrrh, five hundred shekels, and of sweet cinnamon, half so much, even two hundred and fifty shekels, and of sweet calamus, two hundred fifty shekels, and of cassia, five hundred shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary, and of the oil, olive, at hen. And thou shalt make it an oil of holy ointment, an ointment compound after the art of the apoxcary. It shall be a holy anointing oil. Thou shalt anoint the tabernacle of the congregation therewith, and the ark of the testimony, and the table, and all the vessels, and the candlestick, and all the vessels, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering with all his vessels, and the laver, and his foot. And thou shalt sanctify them, that they may be most holy. Whatsoever toucheth them shall be holy. We're talking about the anointing of worship here, the worship area. What is anointing though for us today? Completely different, isn't it? The anointing for us is the Holy Spirit. We have an anointing that enables us to understand the Word of God. Isn't that wonderful? Have you ever thought about the fact that without the Holy Spirit, they would just be words on a page? You would not be able to comprehend what's there. And we have a major problem at times in the fact that we open the Bible and just start reading and we never remember to ask the Holy Spirit to enlighten the Word for us. You may, you'll get something out of it, but not the same way as if you released everything over to the Holy Spirit and those words jump off of the page. I cannot tell you how many times I have read a passage maybe a hundred times. And that hundred and first time, a word or a phrase will jump out at me and the meaning is there. The Holy Spirit enlightened it for me. You know, the reason the Bible is being made real to so many today is the Holy Spirit. You know, it's, it's quick, it's living, it's a living word. And we need the Holy Spirit. It's not the teacher, it's not the preacher, it's the Spirit of God using the Word of God. You know, I, I can preach all day long, but I'm not going to give you the same insight you'll get from the Holy Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit can anoint you. You don't have to go to some man and have him drip oil on you to be anointed. People have the wrong idea about things, don't they? You know, you can go to the God right now and you can say to Him, God, open my heart, open my mind, open my life so that I can understand Your Word. And I'll tell you what, you better be ready. Because if you pray that honestly, you're going to see something you've never seen before. In 1 John 2.20 says, But ye have an urchin in the Holy One, and ye know all things. Urchin means an anointing. And it's ours. If we read it without understanding, but we have an anointing from the Holy One. That's the Holy Spirit. We have something special. 1 John 2.27 goes on to say, But the anointing which ye have received of Him abideth in you, and ye, not, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in Him. That's a powerful phrase and a powerful verse. The Holy Spirit is the one who can open your, your mind and heart when you go to work with God and understand His Word. That's the reason that we need the same anointing. But we don't have to mix up all the ingredients that Moses mixed up to anoint the furniture of the tabernacle. He was, what he was doing was demonstrating that everything there was for God's use. It was sanctified, set aside for a purpose, and the purpose was for God. 
You know, what a blessing it is when we go to the Bible, we read the Word of God, the Holy Spirit lights it for us. That's a blessing. It brings a blessing to your heart. It's exciting. And we need that. There's so many people today who are asking questions. <clears throat> What's life all about? What shall I do today? How shall I com communicate my needs? Boy, how many times have you heard people say, What's life all about? Why am I here? Yeah, why am I here? God created us to have fellowship with Him. Why am I here? To have fellowship with God. How do I have fellowship with God? I have to come to Jesus Christ. That's the only way we can have peace. And what shall I do today? I'm going to serve the Lord. That We need to be like Joshua. As for me and my house, what are we going to do? We're going to serve the Lord. That's what we do today. How do I communicate my needs? We have a 24-hour hotline to the Lord. Anytime, any place, we can go to the Lord in prayer. And you can talk to Him about your needs. You can communicate with Him. He already knows. And the Holy Spirit, of course, will give you the words to say. Well, in those times when you can't really find the words to pray, it's the Holy Spirit that allows that. He makes utterances for us. And I'm not talking about speaking in mumbo jumbo, who stole my Honda, who untied my bow tie. I'm talking about He brings out what's in your heart to speak to the Lord. So ask God to let the Holy Spirit make God real in your life. And make His Word real in your heart. And the joy is going to be yours like you've never seen before. You're going to be anointed like you've never been anointed before. I'm not talking about you jumping up and down and rolling in the aisles. That's not what I'm talking about. But you'll have a joy that you've never seen before. So the next thing Moses is going to talk about here, the incense. Now incense got a really bad, I think, uh, name back in the 60s, maybe before that. I remember the 60s, the hippies and incense and all that. That's not what the Bible's talking about here. Verse 30 says, And thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil unto me throughout your generations. Upon man's flesh shall it not be poured. Neither shall ye make any other like it. After the composition of it, it is holy. And it shall be holy unto you. I want to stop right there. It's holy. God says, I tell, I've given you directions. This is the only thing I want. <clears throat> it is set aside for my purpose. And it shall be holy for you. For your purpose too. Whosoever compoundeth any like it, or whosoever putteth any of it upon a stranger, shall even be cut off from his people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take unto thee sweet spices, Statsy, Onchia, Galibum, these sweet spices with pure frankincense, of each shall thee be a like weight, and thou shalt make it a perfume a confection after the art of hypocrisy, tempered together, pure and holy. And thou shalt beat some of it very small and put of it before the testimony of the tabernacle of the congregation, for I will meet with thee and it shall be unto you most holy. Now the incense we're talking, told about in verse 34 was made of sweet spices all put together with pure frankincense. Uh, the first is a raisin, as a, as a gum that's oozed from the trees up on Mount Gilead. Uh, it's called, matter of fact, the balm of Gilead. Uh, another one is from a shellfish that resembles a crab. The uh, galabum was taken from the leaves of a uh, serene plant. These are blended together with pure frankincense. It was a secret formula that has long since been lost. The mixture of these spices gave off a sweet incense. And it was not to be duplicated. It was not to be uh, reproduced in any other form. People don't know how to do it now. Why? Why is it not needed right now? 
because you don't have a tabernacle of a congregation. You don't have a tabernacle. You don't have a holy temple. It's not needed. Here again, when things are not there anymore, it's because God doesn't need them right now. There's always so much about the Ark of the Covenant. Well, if God needed the Ark of the Covenant right now, you'd know where it was. Or the furnishings of the tabernacle. When they're needed, they will be there. These things are not needed right now. And as for the perfume which thou shalt make, it shall not make it to yourselves according to the composition thereof. It shall be unto thee holy for the Lord. Whosoever shall make like unto that to smell thereto shall even be cut off from his people. You notice what people try to counterfeit these things? The penalty is to be removed from the people. In other words, they're being, for lack of a better word, excommunicated from Israel. Get out. You are false. Something you're not supposed to be doing. A false teacher. A false leader, God says, no. Do not let people counterfeit anything. It's almost as if God is preparing Israel all these years before Daniel's prophecy of the 70 weeks. He's already preparing them for people or a person who is going to counterfeit the word of God, counterfeit the Messiah. He's telling them right now, beware of the Antichrist to come, isn't he? So no one was to use this formula for himself. It may have been a very nice smelling perfume. Those if, if they had the compound for it today, you'd probably see commercials on TV to make sure you get it for Christmas. I've already seen so many. We were watching the other night in this commercial. I couldn't figure out what it was for. It went on and on, made no sense. And it was a commercial for a cologne or something. I said, how in the world does that sell anything? But that's what would happen if somebody had this fragrance. They're trying to be trying to sell it to you. They'd probably call it God's holy perfume. I don't use it. And God's not going to accept a counterfeit. Did you notice that? He wants the real thing. It's like your heart. <coughs> he doesn't want a counterfeit heart. He doesn't want the words. He doesn't want you to, oh yeah, I believe. And then you go out and live like the world, you don't believe a thing. That's counterfeit. He doesn't want that. God will not use that. He wants the real thing. You know, the altar speaks of us, speaks to us of prayer and worship. That's where the altar of incense, you know, when they burn the incense there, represents prayer. It was a place where we are to offer our praise and thanksgiving and our requests. And it is not to be duplicated. Interesting that we're talking about the uh, altar of incense. Because as we begin the Christmas sermons, where do we begin a Christmas sermon? We're going to begin it at the altar of incense. When Gabriel comes to John, uh, to uh, Zechariah, what's he doing? He is at the altar of incense and he's praying as he serves there. Interesting that it runs right here together. You know, that's one of the things that amazes me. So many times, Donnie's Sunday school lesson will just flow right into the morning service and we have no idea what we're, either one of us are doing, but God does. And it will flow together. The ideas will flow. It just works. God always works. And this formula is not to be used in an attempt to try to try and make the incense or worship pleasing to the natural man. Oh boy. We have run into that in these last years where services are designed to entertain, to be pleasing. It's not the way it's supposed to be. It's not supposed to be pleasing to the normal man. His, man, his heart's supposed to be right and he wants to hear the word of God. And if the word of God penetrates that heart, it steps on his toes, then he says, Lord, I need to change my ways. What do I need to do? You know, you can't make worship pleasing to the natural man. If you have a whole room full of unbelievers and you just try to preach to them and keep them happy, not a one of them is going to get saved. 
You have to preach the Word. You have to stay in the Word. We're to worship God in spirit and in truth. And all sorts of things are used and have been through history to try and trap people into going to church. I often wondered if, for example, if, if you put a clause in a contract, and if you attend our church, we'll give you a 10% discount on it, how many people would come for the discount? But see, you can't bring people in that way. You can't buy people. You can't force people. You know, Christianity is not by the edge of the sword. That's Islam. It has to be a heart truth there. Nothing but the Word of God should and can be used to accomplish God's plan. Nothing else. I've heard some people, you flip through TV, you ever done that? And sit down and watch some of these guys and they'll talk for 30 minutes and never once open the Bible, never once quote. That's a speech. That's not a sermon. You're not going to accomplish anything without the Word of God. You have to make sure that the Word of God is foremost and everything centers around the Word of God. You know, I've often told you that I never leave the pulpit. You know, I know some people like, they, they over here, they're over there, they're down there. That's their way. For me, the center of the service is the Word of God. The Word of God is on the pulpit spread out before me. If I'm over here, the focus is on me. It's not on the Word of God. So I stay right here. We have to stay focused on the Word. That's what God wants. You have to make sure that it's foremost and that everything in that service is centered around that Word. Now, I want to mention, again, there were two altars. The burnt offering it, altar is where God deals with the sinner. It speaks of the earth and the sin of man. The altar of incense speaks of heaven and of holiness. The burnt offering speaks of what Christ did for us on this earth. The incense altar speaks of what Christ is doing for us in heaven right now. It also speaks of our prayer and our part in worship. It speaks of Christ who prays for us. He's the one who truly praises God and prays for us. He's the one who genuinely worships God for us. He is our intercessor. How are we to learn to worship? How are we to learn to worship? Well, that's a big question. That's a more important question than why am I here and where am I going and what am I going to do? Well, you're not going to learn it at the bloody altar where you go as a sinner and take Christ as your Savior. You enter the holy place and you come to the golden altar. There's no sacrifice at all there because the question of your salvation is settled. When you worship God, the sin question has been settled. The very basis rests upon the fact that this altar once a year was consecrated with blood. As believers, we are all accepted as, belo as beloved in the Father before God. God hears our prayers because of what Christ has done for us. And I'm going to have to stop there and we'll pick up next time in chapter 31. We went a little long with our business meeting.